Good morning. There we go. It's a beautiful day that God created today, isn't it? It's also going to be very hot, so drink lots of water today. Stay in the shade. I, I don't get the enjoyment of that today. I put off cutting grass, so that will be the afternoon chore. Um, we have been in a study of the book of Revelation. We are in chapter 3 this morning. If you'll start turning to chapter 3 for our study. Next week um, is my favorite class on Revelation. So if I have to pick one chapter out of the book of Revelation, chapter 4 is it. So if you have friends, family members, um, I will, if they want to see me get fired up when I'm, I'm teaching a class, it will be next week. You will never listen to a thunderstorm the same way again after that class. I'm not saying, just <clears throat> come back next week, invite your family and friends, you will enjoy that class. Not saying that you're not going to enjoy today, but I really like chapter 4 in the book of Revelation. Okay, <clears throat> confession time. When I was growing up, let's say, um, <clears throat> my parents learned that punishment by switches or belts and things like that just didn't work on me. I just, okay. But what did work on me was confinement. I cannot stand being in a room by myself, so that quickly became my punishment. <clears throat> So during my teenage years, I spent a lot of time in my room. We, I was not allowed to watch TV. I could listen to music, and I could study. So I developed a game in my head, and as a rock band would start playing on the radio, I could tell you the name of that rock band. And remember, this was a lot of time. So by the end of my confinement, later in life. Uh, I could tell you the name of the rock band when they began touring, how many band members were there, what instruments they played, uh, all the lyrics to their song, their favorite hits. I mean, it was a lot of time I spent in confinement, right? <laughs> so, so the other day, I was reading an article and it was about one of these bands from the early 80s. We're talking over, you know, decades ago, but they're still touring. It was just really hard for me to believe because they were sort of like one of these one-hit wonders, but they're still out there touring on the reputation of that one hit that they made several years ago. So it just astounded me. So it's sort of like Richard's lesson this morning. I do have a point to this, okay? <laughs> so the band is not making any new music, still that one hit. So you can go to a concert, listen to this band, and they are living off of their reputation from a song from 1981. Okay? Now Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 1 through 3. And to the angel of the church of Sardis write, who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name that you are alive, but you're dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, <clears throat> which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, and keep it and repent. If, therefore, you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at the hour I will come upon you. So, <clears throat> it's interesting to note that the church of Sardis, no one knew that they were dead. They thought they were alive. But when Jesus says, I know, to this church, he says, you're dead. What were they doing? What had happened to the church at Sardis? They were living on their reputation, just like that rock band. 
They had a reputation several years ago. This would be a church, you say, I think I'm going to go travel. Uh, I got some business dealings, or business dealings up around Sardis. I think I'll go worship with them this weekend. Oh, that's a great church. That's a great church. Heard about them. What did you hear about them? Things from a long time ago. What are they doing now? Well, I, you know, if, if you go up there today, they're going to have an Aunt B pickle tasting contest. They're going to taste pickles for Jesus. It, they had left. They weren't doing anything. They had forgotten what their mission was. And they had replaced it with things to make people believe that they were an alive church. Jesus says, you did. The church was dead. Have you ever been to a dead church? You ever seen them, heard about them, read about them? When you go there, do they think they're dead? No. They think that they're alive. One of the things that we must do as the Lord's church is remain alive. So, the, so he says, Christ says, I, I know your works. Went too far. And they're not good. The things that you're doing are not helping. They're hurting. So he says, <clears throat> you at the church of Sardis have become superficial Christians. You are fake Christians. You want everybody to think that you're of me. You want people to think that you're alive. You like to go out and tell people, I'm a Christian, but you don't act like it. You don't do the things that make you alive in Christ. <clears throat> so they claim to be of Christ, but they're not living like Christ. They're fake. So we've got to ask ourselves this morning when we're studying the church of Sardis, am I a fake Christian? Do I really have the devotion that Christ is looking for in his disciple? Am I wearing the name Christ, but my actions are showing differently? Am I just going through the motions? Have I mentally and or physically checked out? If so, how do I fix it? How do I become alive again in Christ? How do I show people that I am not fake? Y'all, the, the reality point in my Christianity came when I was in the military. Okay? My lifestyle in the military is the definition of being in the military. I got went in the military when I was 17 years old. The first thing that they, your older military people, and you're 17, they want to show you a lifestyle that is not of Christ. So they said, Paul, have you ever been to the Airmen's Club? Nope, never been to an Airmen's Club. I'm 17 years old. Not a problem. We'll show you the Airmen's Club. And later, you want to see the NCO? Nope, never been to the NCO Club. We'll show you the NCO Club. In fact, when you're in basic training, the only way you get away is to go to a club. That's what you do. So I didn't have, um, even though I was raised in the church, I became a fake Christian. One day in our office there, there was a lady and she was trying her best to study God's Word. And I was just sitting there doing my work and she was talking to another uh, airman that was there. And she asked them, she said, uh, hey, have you, do you know the answer to this? I'm trying to do my Bible lesson. We're just getting ready for Sunday. I'm trying to do my Bible lesson. And she asked the lady the question, and I gave her the answer. And she ignored me. It sort of hurt my feelings. I said, the answer to your question, I don't want to hear that from you, Paul. And I said, why? Why won't you, I mean, that's the answer. You can go look at it, it's right there. I grew up in the church, and that's the answer. Because I don't want you to tell me the answer. And I said, well, why not? And she goes, you're a fake Christian. Mm. Mm, 
wake up moment, right? And so I went home and examined my life and I said, you know what? She's exactly right. I mean, I can, I, at that age, I could quote you, I grew up in the church and with my parents and we didn't live an ungodly life. We, we studied the Bible all the time. I knew the answers, but I wasn't living it. So, and it was very apparent to this young lady that wasn't even a Christian, and she was studying to become a Christian. Paul, I know you know the answer, but you're a fake Christian, and I don't want you telling me how to become a Christian. I don't want you giving me the answers to God's Word. You're fake. That's what Jesus is saying to the church at Sardis. You had a reputation at one time of being alive, but now you are dead. People don't want to hear about you anymore. People don't want you giving them answers anymore. You're a fake Christian. So we have to ask ourselves this morning, is that where I am? Have I become a fake Christian? How do I fix it? Well, Jesus says, wake up. In verses 2 and 3, wake up. First thing you have to do is like me, being slapped in the face, not physically, but <clears throat> are you a fake Christian? Are you just going through the motions? Jesus says, wake up. Then he says, he tells him, strengthen what remains. It's not too late. It's not too late to turn your life around, to get out of this slumber that you are in and come back. But you're at the point of no return. If you don't fix this, you're going to go down the other road. And it's going to be more and more difficult for you to come back to fix this problem. He's saying, I want you to fix it, and I want you to fix it now. So he's telling them to act quickly because they're at that point of no return. Then he tells them he wants them to remember. Just like when I had to go home and face the facts, I had to remember what had happened before. I had to remember how far I was from where I needed to be. Okay? <clears throat> And it wasn't, uh, if you want me to fast forward in my life a little bit, it wasn't until, she's not in here, that little Italian lady, she's the one that really straightened me out. Like, all those years with my parents, they were good, they're good people. All those people that I grew up with in the church, they were very good people. But little Italian women, she, she sort of straightened out my life, okay? <laughs> See? Um, I've told this story to other classes. I went to college, and I had no idea. I mean, I grew up in Springville, Alabama. We had 50 people who graduated in our high school class. It is nothing like it is now. <clears throat> when I got to the first day in college, a guy sitting next to me said, hey, you want to go shoot pole? Hey, I thought we had to go to class. No, Paul, this is college. You can go shoot pole. I thought, man, this is neat. <laughs> so um, my grades came in and my dad said um, your grades came in today son I said really and he said uh, have you not been going to class it has a bunch of incompletes on your score and I said, no I've been shooting pool <laughs> he said you've got one more semester one more semester and if you don't pull these grades up I'm done Hence why I went in the military, because I wanted to test my daddy and say, I wonder if I can shoot poo one more semester and if he's really serious, he was serious. <laughs> so that's where the military came in. <clears throat> when I married uh, Marisa, uh, Marisa said, you're going to have to pick a career here. So you had accounting, you had some IT stuff. I was a disc jockey. I mean, I had all kinds of different avenues going on here. She goes, you're going to have to pick one or just quit, this, or you're wasting money. So she got me on the avenue I needed to be on in life. Very sweet lady if you've not met her. 
Um, Jesus says that we need to wake up, we need to remember, and he says that in this group, even though this group is dead, there is a small remnant of people that have not given up. And if, or to me, what Jesus is saying is like, find those people and do what they're doing. If you can't remember where you were, if you can't find your way back, there are some that are in there that haven't done this yet. They haven't given in. Go find those people. They're going to show you how to get out of this. Remember. 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 Wake up. Start doing those things for, that you've been taught to do. Start doing those things in your life that bring you closer to him and make you alive, not dead. Christ says that those that seek a relationship with him. Okay, wait a minute. Are we doing that right? The, the sign-off sheets? Uh-oh. Hang on, brother. It's supposed to go that way, right? This way? Okay. Then back up here somewhere. Okay. Okay, so he says, those that seek a relationship with him will be clothed in white garments. So the white garments are a sign of victory. They're a sign of purity. You want to be with Jesus. You want to be victorious. You want a life of purity. Remember, wake up and come back to him. That's right. Mm. And he says, I'll never blot your name, or I won't blot out the name of the person that does this out of the book of life, and I'll confess his name before the Father and his angels. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that it? When you come to heaven and you're standing before the throne of our Lord and Savior, what do you want? He's going to open a book and he's going to confess. Now the opposite of that is also true. He's going to open his book and he's not going to confess. And he's not going to say your name before the Father and his angels. Where do you want to be? Where do I want to be? I want Jesus to say, hey, Father, this is Paul. He, he was dead one time. He's alive now. He worked hard in the kingdom. Confess your name before the Father. I mean, there's nothing, nothing that holds a higher honor than for our Lord and Savior to confess your name to his Father and before his angels. Nothing else in this world matters. I don't care how much you accumulate. I don't care how many buildings that your name is on. Doesn't matter. One of, the, one of the saddest people I've ever met passed away just a few days ago. And his life goal, his whole life was centered around having his name on the side of a building. I mean, millions. Spit millions. Finally got it a few years ago. And got his name on the building. Spit millions for that to happen. He's dead. And his life goal was to have his name on that building. It was not a religious building. <clears throat> but it's there. But he's not. I don't want my name confessed on some university building somewhere. I want my name confessed before the Father and his angels. Okay, now we're going to go into verses 5 through 6. He who overcomes, thus shall be, well, that's what I just did. We're going to go through 7 through 13. And to the angel, to the church in Philadelphia, right? He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, 
who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I've put before you an open door which no one can shut because you have little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come to you, bow down at your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you've kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, the hour which is about to come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell upon the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have in order that no one take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go from it anymore. I will write my name upon the name of I will write my name upon the name of my God and the name of the city of my God and the new Jerusalem, which comes down of heaven from my God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Did you know that we spend annually $20.64 billion on alarm security monitoring? $20.64 billion. That's a lot of money. Right? Why do we do that? Why do we, as Americans, pay $20.64 billion a year for alarm monitoring? We want to feel secure. When you punch that little code in before you leave the house, you feel good about yourself when you went about groceries, didn't you? My house is secure. All my stuff in there, it's all secure. Right? When you went on vacation and the alarm went off, what are you doing? You get that little call. We've called the police. Oh my goodness, all my stuff's gone. I'm not secure. I don't feel good today. Right? We like to feel secure. That's why we came up with things like 401k accounts. We're going to retire. I want to have money in my 401k so I can retire. Or we like pensions. That's why we like Social Security. Makes us feel secure. Money in the checking account makes you feel secure. So Jesus is going to talk to this church, though, about being truly secure. So let's go with it. Jesus says... Describes himself, he's the Holy One and the True One. These are Messianic titles. So if you want to make a note there, you can put Mark 124, you can put John 6, 69. Those are titles identifying him as the Messiah. He said he's the one that we put our hope and our trust in. Well, wait a minute. Is that true? I put all my hope and I put all my trust into Jesus? Is that true? Yes, that's true. But that's not what everybody else tells me. That's not what they were talking about at work. You know, they, they were saying, you got to put your hope and trust in X, Y, Z. Right? It's what they say. But you're a child of God. I'm a child of God. I belong to Him. Therefore, my whole devotion, everything about me, is for Him. That's where I put my hope and my trust, because I'm His child. Now, to everybody else out there, that is really, really strange that you would do that. They don't understand that. They don't understand how you call yourself a child of God, and you tell people, all my hope and my devotion and my focus, my life is focused on my God. So you won't go out and go dancing with us tonight? Nope, not going to do it. I'm going to stay home and study my scriptures because I want to be closer to God. Now, they will tell you that's only for preachers and radicals. Only preachers and radicals are that devoted to God. You can slide a little bit. 
They're the ones that have to maintain that. You don't have to do that. Nope, I'm a child of God. I am going to stay focused on my God. I've got my mission in my life. Jesus told it to me. If you would like to hear about it, I'll be glad to teach it to you. My hope and my trust is in the Christ. Okay. <clears throat> so Jesus says that he has the key of David. That is from Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, meaning he has complete authority of his kingdom. And when he talks about opening and shutting, what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open, means that he has complete authority over salvation, and he is the judge. Complete authority over everyone's life. Now, others might think that they have the rule of their life. They do not. They are a created being, and a created being is subject to its creator, no matter whether that cre creation <laughs> wants to bow down at the feet of the creator or not, they are still subject to the creator. Full subjection, authority and all judgment has been given to our Lord. Then he says, <clears throat> he knows their works, and this church has little power. That probably means that they're a small congregation. They're small in number. But they've kept his word, and they have not denied Jesus. So they're not like others that we've already studied that have denied Jesus, have, have forgotten Jesus, <clears throat> have lost their love for Jesus, this church has not done that. They have not denied him. They are living Christ before those in their community. The community in which they live is not a very good community. They're having a struggle and in and, and making an impact there because people just don't want to hear the lesson. But they're not giving up. They've not denied Jesus. And he said there's an hour of trial that's coming for this church. Jesus says he's going to keep these faithful followers, but he's not saying that they're not going to experience hardship and they're not going to experience suffering. So too many times we equate hardship and suffering that God is mad at me. That's not the case. It's taught throughout the whole Bible. God's people will endure hardships. God's people will endure suffering. It's to make us stronger. It's to make us look for our home, our permanent home, not our temporary home here. So he's commending them for what they have done. They have not denied him. But he said he's not telling them that this church, with what's about to happen to Jerusalem, and what's about to happen to uh, what the Roman Empire is doing. He's saying, you know, you, you're not exempt from that, but I'm going to be with you. You want security? Realize that Jesus is with you all the time. You're feeling bad about yourself today? Remember, Jesus is there with you. Something's going on in your life, medically, Jesus is there with you. Financially, Jesus is there with you. And he has an answer. You don't know the answer, but you will. Have you ever done that in life? Have you ever looked back and saw all the times God was with you? Like, I thought I was supposed to be a DJ. No, Paul, you're supposed to be an accountant. Well, I, I mean, I, I was supposed to be doing the news. No, Paul, you're supposed to be doing tax return. You know, though, in my job, in my contact, I have the opportunity almost on a daily, sometimes multiple times daily, to teach people about God. And I'm an accountant. 
Y'all wouldn't think that, would you? There's not a week that goes by that I don't invite 11 people, minimum, 11 to 15 people, to church. That's not bragging on myself. It's just part of a business talk that I give because I tell them they can call me at any time except from the hours of 8 to 12 unless they're sitting next to me in church. Then they can't talk to me about business. I'll buy them lunch later and we can discuss business, but they can always are invited to go to church with me. I had one guy said, I'm coming and I'm bringing a goat. So well, we don't really have to bring a goat, but you can come. <laughs> so, if a guy ever shows up in our parking lot with a goat, he's looking for me. All right, the hour's coming, and he wants them to be faithful. He wants them to remain too. If they, uh, if they remain faithful, if they continue not to deny him, he says, I'm going to make you a pillar in the temple of my God. Y'all ever watch those home fix-it shows? Fixer-upper shows, you know? So there's always, there's one wall in there, right? There's always this one wall. Can't touch that wall. Take that wall down, the roof's coming in. So the support wall, whatever, whatever they call it. Jesus says, I'm going to make you a pillar in the temple of God. You're going to become part of the permanent structure of the temple. Nobody's going to take you out. And then he says, I'm going to write on him a new name. And that image carries with it the idea of ownership. Christ owns us. We belong to him. That's where I want to be. All right? If God is your employer, or your boss, whatever you want to call it, if God owns you, that's who you want to be. That's the best boss you could ever have. That's the best owner you could ever have. I want to be owned by Christ. Okay, now. Now I have nine minutes. Okay. And the, we're now to the heart of the lesson. <laughs> we're about halfway through. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. They're Jews. Okay, so what did the Jewish people believe? What do they still believe? They're the chosen people of God, right? And Jesus is telling them, he said, I know these Jews are causing trouble, okay? So, and he said, I know that right now you see it one way, but I know they're not. They're not people of God. And he said, I'm going to correct that. I'm going to make it so that they understand that I am the Christ. Now, what's about to happen They're going to understand. And they're going to be out looking for, because this is not just going to be confined to that area. Okay, it's, it's going to spread. So they're actually, this Jews that say they're the people of God are actually going to come to the people of God and say, we need some help. So just put it in that perspective. Okay. Yes, sir. Do what now? It's about it's telling this church to get ready because of what's fixing to happen, yes. Okay, and don't, I don't want everybody to get caught up just on the destruction of Jerusalem. Remember in our first class, when Vespasian comes through, it's a destruction of Judea. And he's got them boxed in to the city of Jerusalem. But there's already occurring, even as this letter is being written, countless persecutions from the Jews against the Christians 
And Rome is trying to stomp out these, these fires, and they're pushing them into the city of Jerusalem. So don't forget that part. It is widespread. It is all of Judea, not just the destruction. The, the destruction of Jerusalem is the epitome. It's, it's when everything happens. It's when everything comes to a head. That's the destruction of Jerusalem. But it's already happening at this time. Mm. Yep. Okay. So, now I got six minutes. Can I hold y'all over just a few minutes? Y'all be okay? Because I really want to get to chapter four next week. I am excited about chapter four. Okay. 14 through 22. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds that you're neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I'm rich and I become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich and white garments, that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness might not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him, and I'll dine with him, and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, so a few points. <clears throat> Jesus describes himself as the amen. He is the yes to the Father. He fulfilled everything. All prophecy about the Messiah, Jesus fulfilled even his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. He is the yes. He is the amen. When Jesus would say, truly, truly, that's the same word. Amen, amen. I, and Jesus saying, I am the amen. I am the answer. I am the yes. <clears throat> He's saying, I am faithful, I am trustworthy, and what I say will assuredly come to pass. I am God, is what Jesus is telling them. And the problem with the church is that they had started doing nothing. They're just sitting there. So there's a, a city, Richard talked about this a few weeks ago, there's a city about seven miles to the north. They're known for their hot springs. People would go there to be healing, just like, remember, FDR went down to South Georgia? Same thing. You know, people would go to hot springs thinking that it had an a element in the water that could heal them. They were seeking it. They would do anything to seek healing. They would go to this town and go to the hot springs. To the south, you have Colossae, less than 10 miles away. It's known for its good, drinkable water. In this part of the world, you wanted good, drinkable water. This town was known for its good, drinkable water. And then you have Leo to see it right in the smack middle of both of them. If they tried to pump in the hot water to attract people to come to their town, it was useless by the time it got there. If they tried to bring water, from the, it was dirty and undrinkable by the time it got there. They are slapped down in the middle. Jesus is not saying, I'd rather you be... Uh, hot for God or just a plain old sinner, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, Leo, to see you're right in the middle and you're useless. You're not doing anything. He said, I wish that you were, could be like cold drinking water that had a use or hot springs that had a use. You got no use at all. Now, those are chilling words for a church to hear. You're totally useless. That's about the worst thing you could say to somebody, right? But Jesus is telling them, wake up. 
There's things you can do. I, I, I've got, I got plans for you. And you're just sitting there. Now that's a wake-up call for all of us. Are we just sitting there? Have we become that type of Christian where, you know, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Or do I want to go out and I want to teach? Do I listen to Richard's lessons on Sunday and worship to our God and say, ooh, well, there's a good point. I can, you know, I, got, I know somebody that needs to know that, including myself. Do we do that? Or are we just satisfied sitting there doing nothing, being useless? Do you have Jesus, uh, these people, their problem, they, they tethered themselves to the world. They started trusting in their riches, thinking they could handle it, and said, we don't really need God. We can handle it ourselves. And Jesus said, let's take it. Let, let, let's look at this for real. He said, you're naked. You're poor. You got eye problems. You can't even see. And he said, I, I want you to come to me. Come back. Come to me. I can give you gold and silver. I can clothe you. And I can give you eye ointment so that you'll be able to see. All these things that you think you don't need, you ain't even got. But I can give them to you. I can help you. Y'all see what he's saying? He's the answer to everything. All through this, you should realize when Jesus says, I know. Jesus knows everything about us. He knows what's in our minds, what's in our hearts, what we're doing, what's bothering us, what makes us happy. He knows us. And he's the only answer. He is the only one that can truly help. If you've got an eye problem, what do you do? Hopefully you set up an appointment with an eye doctor. Jesus says that's him. <clears throat> I had a favorite pair of pants, and I'll let y'all go. I had a favorite pair of pants. Marisa bought them for me for her Father's Day one year. Loved those pants. <clears throat> I got up to do a business meeting one day. Looked down on the back of my pants, which I never do look at the back of my pants. That's a big old hole. <laughs> I asked Marisa, said, can you sew that hoe up? Because I love these pants. No, Paul, those, whole, those pants are finally going in the trash. <clears throat> Jesus said, you don't even realize you're naked. I'll clothe you. I'll give you the eye ointment. Don't tie yourself to this world. Your spiritual life, your, the next life is what we're going for, not this one. Thank you all for coming today. Next week, chapter 4, please come back. I've been working on chapter four for about six weeks. Don't hurt my feelings. <laughs>